park system. Um, I, you know, as the sort of cleanup batter or whatever, I, when I did my presentation, I was hopeful that the themes that I talk about reflect the themes that others have talked about, and I think they do. Um, but I also want to just make one comment that's not in there. And as somebody who lives in a kind of mid-sized city in the Midwest, um, you know, you heard from, you're hearing from Louisville and Birmingham, okay? And I think there are two takeaways there. One is that these are issues beyond the coasts and the big cities. And the second is, is that great projects and innovation can come out of those mid-sized cities. You certainly saw it in the talk on Birmingham, and I hope you'll see that um, in my talk. Um, the, the biggest thing I want to do today is to um, zoom up to the global stage um, and zoom out into the future. Uh, because that's, you know, while our project in Louisville is primarily about building a world-class systemic addition to Louisville's public park system, we also want to set a model, uh, you know, and capture what we've learned and share it because we think it is one of the critical environmental and critical, crit critical urban issues of the 21st century. So my talk today is, first of all, I'm going to just touch briefly on what is happening, which is the largest migration in human history as the rest of the world migrates into cities, okay? The United States crossed the line of over 50% urban in the early 50s, the world crossed it in 2008, and that barely scratched the surface, okay? So um, uh, uh, someone earlier referred to the fact that the United States is gonna grow from 320 million to 400 million over the next 35 years. Don't forget, 80% of that new population is likely to be living in cities. It may even be more. So that's another 60 to 65 million people immigrating or being born into our city. So even though we see ourselves as very urbanized, there's still a lot of work to do. I'm then going to talk about the Parklands of Floyd's Fork. I'll give you a sort of a brief introduction, and then I have a, about 50 pictures. I really just kind of want to give you a sense of what it means to do a project, because there is incredible joy in watching uh, something come out of the ground and then watching people use that. And that's certainly a great pleasure of the work that I do, and I want to share that with you a little bit. And at the end, I want to come back. And again, I was very pleased to hear people using placemaking and stewardship. Um, but really what we have learned in that process, and I used to be a professor. I'm now a, a sort of social entrepreneur, I guess. But, um, but I had to do a little systematizing. So I'm going to try to give you something, particularly to the students in the audience that you can take home and feel like you got your money's worth today. Um, and then I have, I have a few sort of um, cautionary tales at the end. Um, so this just shows um, the world population. And I think probably everybody in this room is aware of this. Um, but I think there's something really important to remember. And it touches on a lot of the themes that we've hit on today. And so I'm a historian by training. I have a PhD in history, and to me, there is a direct historical analogy between the tenements of New York City in the late 19th, mid and late 19th centuries and the favelas of Brazil, the slums of Mumbai. And so if we want to go back to this gentleman, Frederick Law Olmsted, we can take not only his great genius as a designer, but also his great genius as a social thinker. And that is that parks are infrastructure. And like any other kind of infrastructure, they work best if they're put in first. It is very hard to come back and retrofit any kind of infrastructure um, once the city has grown. And we all know that all great modern cities have great public park systems. Well, what happens if Beijing and Mumbai and Rio de Janeiro don't convert those millions and billions of people uh, moving into cities and don't create for them the kinds of livable places that make urban living bearable, right? And to me, parks are not soft infrastructure. They are in many ways the most important infrastructure because once you get there, you have to have high quality of life. And that's not just about roads and sewers and power lines, et cetera. So um, I think you'll see in our project that, that this idea um, of building parks ahead of the growth of the city is fundamental, and again, I think if you zoom up into the global stage and outward into the, the 21st century, you're gonna realize just how important these ideas are for these very fast-growing cities. Um, all right, so uh, our, our, my organization is called 21st Century Parks, but our project is called the Parklands of Floyd's Fork, um, and I'm just gonna give you, you know, sort of a, a tour of this project and, and a little bit of narration about it. So I know I live in Louisville and not everybody knows where Louisville is, so I thought it's always good to sort of remind you that uh, we're in the Ohio River Valley. We're sort of a little bit southern, a little bit midwestern. Um, and our project is in the eastern third 
of uh, Jefferson County, Louisville Metro, um, and not all counties in the south are named Jefferson. Apparently, they might take that away. But, um, <laughs> but that, that red line is the boundary of Louisville Metro. Okay, And then Floyd's Fork is that stream that runs north to south through the eastern third of Jefferson County or Louisville Metro, um, which is what our, where our project is located. And just to blow that up a little bit, we're basically sort of in that. You can see I-64, which runs east-west. We start just below that and go about 15 miles as the crow flies, about 19 miles as our bike path winds, and about 25 miles as the stream meanders. Um, so essentially, we cut right through the last big undeveloped part of a top 50 metro area, but we're only 20 minutes from downtown. All right, so I told you a little bit about where it is, and I want you to know what it looks like. This is Floyd's Fork, a prototypical Kentucky stream. There are thousands of them in the state of Kentucky, but there's only one that's 20 minutes from downtown in Kentucky's largest urban area, and that's what makes Floyd's Fork so special. Um, so we have a great geography. We also have great natural history. These are seven, seven whooping cranes. There's only 100 of them left in the eastern North American population. They stopped over a couple years ago for about six weeks. They've never come back. Who knows? You know, they, they follow a different stream every year. But uh, they have a seven and a half foot wingspan. They take off in formation. And I think they are symbolic of what 4,000 acres of natural area of open space can do, even on the edge of a, a big metropolitan area. Um, there's also a great cultural legacy, and so there's a little bit of talk about this mixing of, of sort of the ecological side of parks and the cultural side of parks. Our master planning very much centered on, uh, you know, finding a balance between those things. All right, so you know where it is, you know a little bit of what it looks like. Why would we do this? And again, parks are city-shaping infrastructure, and if you go back to Olmsted's first park, Central Park, begins at 59th Street in the south on the southern end. Uh, when they built that park, it was about 30 blocks north of the edge of the city at that time, and yet they had the temerity to name it Central Park, right? So Olmsted was very clear that this park is going to shape our city in important ways, both geographically, you know, putting a, a sort of stamp of green in the middle of the city, and also in terms of the culture and the spirit of the city. And city shaping to us means both those things. It is a geographic enterprise, but it's also a sort of cultural and almost spiritual exercise in terms of how, it, how parks can change a community. So that's Olmsted Sr.'s first park in the 1850s. In the 1890s, he comes to Louisville, and we are the last system designed by Olmsted. Very important from the beginning of his career when he designed individual parks to the end of his career when he came to cities and said, you need to design systemically. Okay, Critically important, when you, again, when you think about these very fast-growing urban areas. So uh, Louisville was about the size of that white blob in the middle, and he laid out the three main uh, parks. And you guys have already seen pictures of Cherokee Park this morning. I grew up two blocks from Cherokee Park. Um, the comments Stuart made about that park shaping his, in the, his interest in the outdoors absolutely applies to me as well. So, uh, and, but they were well beyond the edge of the city, and then the city grew around them. So every project needs a big idea. Our big idea is do it again, OK? And that's basically it. So what you see in green are the lands that we acquired for this project. And then what you see in that outer circle is um, our sense that we want to reshape the city as it grows. Now, we're behind where Louisville was in the 1890s. There's already a tremendous amount of growth out in this part of the city. And there was kind of a mad scramble to get the lands that we needed ahead of that growth. But you know, our goal is to sort of reshape the urban edge by putting in the infrastructure first. All right, just a few facts about us. Um, we raised, we've raised to date. Um, actually, this uh, needs to be updated since I did it about a week ago. We've now raised $126.5 million um, to buy land and build the project. And we've raised an additional $32 million in endowment. This is in Louisville, Kentucky, which is not New York City or Chicago. So it's, it's not, again, it's a sort of mid-sized mid Midwestern city. Uh, we've put together 3,700 acres, and we did it by doing over 80 separate real estate transactions in seven years with no government condemnation to connect, you know, not just uh, acquire 3,700 acres, but to connect it along that 15-mile corridor. And I can tell you uh, that, you know, as we got, as our gaps got smaller and smaller, we got more and more nervous. But, you know, uh, it just, I, there's funny stories and all kinds of serendipity. Um, so I think as importantly, um, we finished our master plan in 08. Um, we broke ground in 2010, and we'll be done in about a month and a half. 
So we say we are the largest fully funded metropolitan parks project in the country. There are bigger projects acreage-wise who aren't fully funded, and there are fully funded projects who are smaller. But we did both, and most importantly, we're going to be done in under five years. Okay, and as you all know who work in this, that's very fast. Um, we are, uh, uh, 21st Century Parks is a private 501c3. We are responsible for, uh, you know, I founded the project, but um, uh, we raised all the money, we built it, and we're gonna operate it. However, the city is a great partner in this, and we've heard a lot of talk about the need for partnerships, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But uh, there's always, you know, there's been a lot of discussion in the last panel about public and private. Bottom line is, there's, public on one side, private on the other, and I could point anywhere along that spectrum to a highly effective organization executing their work well. We're agnostic. We didn't know when we started this was gonna be our model. We sort of uh, made our way into it, but if you have good leadership, you can make any model work as long as it fits the conditions of the project and the community uh, in which you're working. All right, so our planners took that 3,700 acres and they broke it into four major parks. So again, systemic. So there are many design features that run the length of that project, but each project, each park also has its own separate identity. Some of them are more people-centric, some of them are more natural. So we span that kind of discussion we heard earlier today about you know, how much of this is about people and how much of this is about nature. So just very quickly, um, and we named them after the tributary, so again, that idea of system and systemic nature runs through the project. So. Um, uh, a lick in Kentucky goes back to the salt licks that originally were the buffalo and the bison. Now we have a little connecting piece. That red line is the bike path. It's really all about getting our bike path through there that we call the strand and then Turkey Run. For scale, this is about 1,100 acres. So this will be the largest park in Metro Louisville after a big fur urban forest we have that's about 6,000 acres. And then Broad Run Park, which uh, brings us out to another major road in the south. Um, just for comparison of, to the size of other parks you may know, Wissahickon and Philadelphia Rock Creek um, in D.C., and of course one of Olmsted's great systems, the Emerald Necklace in Boston, th this is to scale. All right. I don't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think we've heard from all the panelists about this, but you know, when we went out to call on people and raise money, we talked a lot about the benefits of the parks. And one of the great things about raising money for parks is they have a lot of different benefits. So the first one, community, it's public space. All right, that goes back to Olmsted. He was not only a great designer, he was a, a great and very articulate uh, speaker and th or thinker and writer about the need for public space, particularly in a democracy as diverse and fast changing as our own. Uh, recreation, I think, is obvious. Um, the main thing is we look at recreation as a kind of box. And on one side is very traditional park infrastructure such as playgrounds and ball fields. Then we have in the kind of in the middle a whole bunch of trails from paved ADA accessible trails through kind of crushed fine trails through hiking paths, dirt paths in the woods. And then we have very large areas in which there are no trails. So if an urban person wants to go out and get a quiet walk in the woods, they can do that. And then all of those are built progressively so that we always have uh, this, a similar experience for someone no matter what their ability level is. And someone, maybe Catherine mentioned walking. Uh, walking is the single largest group of self-identified outdoor exercisers. And yet it is very rare that park master plans actually integrate systemically walking infrastructure in, into that. And that's one of the things that from the beginning we wanted to do. Um, environmental plan, uh, we have a sort of 100-year vision of how we take these 80 parcels, each of which had a, sep a different kind of land use history and trajectory and knit them back together into 4,000 acres of urban ecology. Um, you know, obviously we want Louisville to be a great place to live and work. Um, health, um, uh, Louisville statistics are about like Birmingham's. We're 49th in everything. Um, and I, I'm not a health professional, but uh, last year, the first year we were fully open with about 30% of the parkland. We had 1.2 million visits. If each person burns about 300 calories a visit, that's 360 million calories burned. And I can tell you anecdotally, we don't have data on it, that most of the people coming out here were not pulling out of the gym. Um, because it's kind of like the folks you talked about. They didn't have any access to parks in a, in a, in a way that was really easy. Um, and then education, we have an education program that's two years old. 
that is STEM based. And, um, and this year we hosted about 12,000 kids, a thousand of which were scholarship kids. So all of our programs are inexpensive, but our long-term goal is um, st sustained, uh, you know, without a lot of grants, so self-sustaining, and we never turn anyone away for inability to pay. All right, so um, now I'm gonna give you the visual tour, and I'm gonna try to just sort of flip the slides quickly. Um, but we started with a mosaic, okay? This was not, you know, Yellowstone, or this was a farm, you know, a kind of recently abandoned farmland. Um, lots of diversity out there. Kentucky has, um, you know, we're the third most biodiverse state in terms of freshwater fish populations. We have globally significant populations of freshwater mussels. Uh, we have a lot of deer. Um, uh, we have cicada blooms that, that come out, hatches, at, you know, every few years. Um, this is another shot of the whooping cranes. Um, just incredibly beautiful birds. This is a rainbow darter. Um, again, one of these very unique uh, uh, species. This, this fish was netted along with 20 other species in a creek that's about 10 feet wide, that's 20 feet behind our most popular playground and about 100 feet from our education building. So we can put kids um, and people right into the stream interacting directly with these kinds of resources. Uh, if you can see the stone wall buried in there, we have tremendous cultural resources that are also part of the kind of preservation and integration into the master plan. So, you know, we started with a, a very diverse landscape. And of course, first thing we do is clean it up. We've cleaned up thousands of tires. We've cleaned up um, over a thousand acres of invasive species. So, you know, anytime we took over a parcel, the first step was to clean it up. And then we begin to restore. So we have uh, a bunch of restoration projects underway. Most importantly, last year we got a $3 million grant from the Helmsley Trust to really do a master plan in natural areas to, to tie this together. So we've been doing a lot of scientific, um, sort of in the field data collection, and, um, and out of that we'll begin to, to um, a much more fine scale um, natural areas plan that is very focused on local and regional biodiversity and the, the bringing of, of local people into contact with that. Um, it's a massive construction project. It's about an $85 million um, construction project. This is one of our bike bridges going in. Um, these are a couple of guys. We do a lot of stone walls. These are um, two of the guys that have built most of those stone walls. This is one of our park bridges. This was, we used the federal transportation grant uh, to build that. That bridge is about 50 feet in the air. It's massive. Floyd's Fork is undammed. It's the last sort of truly wild thing um, in the city of Louisville. And I've seen it go from five cubic feet per second, for those of you who know stream flows, to about 16 or 17,000 cubic feet per second in under four or five hours. So when we get a big sort of regional burst, so we had to put the bridges up really high because we have a canoe trail here and we didn't want people to get trapped against the bridges. Now I want to show you a couple sort of before and afters. This was a big sod farm uh, that you see I-64. So this is in the north. This is what it looks like, looked like before we took it over. This is what it looks like today. That's the egg lawn, which is our great lawn. Um, a lawn to me is a critical part of any park that serves what we call the 90% park user. And we, that's our main audience. That's the ordinary people who come out on ordinary days and do very random and individualized things. They run, they walk, they um, are with their significant other, they just broke up with their significant other, they, um, they're having a picnic, they're throwing a Frisbee, they're having a pickup game. So I'll, talk, I'll come back to this idea of the 90% user, but again, kind of a before and after. Here's another before and after. See the two tall pines on the left? Uh, those two tall pines you can see to the left of that kind of middle building. So that's the sort of, this is what it looked like when we started. Um, this is what it looks like now. Um, this is that building that's on the creek. This is a place where we can hold meetings. It's also a major way in which we earn income to support the operations of the park. We get no money from the city to operate. Fully open, we'll have about a $4 million annual budget. Um, this is the inside of that. We do a lot of corporate sessions. And again, these are great ways to bring people out to the park. Um, and I can tell you from experience that people work better in this room because I've worked, we have a consulting business that we use also to raise money. And so we've worked with groups for three or four meetings in a Marriott, and then we bring them here, and it totally changes. And I don't know why that is, you know, to your data about what happens when people get outdoors. This is the um, front side of our education building. One of our goals is an urban park that has National Park Service quality interpretation. So we spent a lot of time and effort to really understand our landscape, what's on it ecologically, culturally, and so on. And then 
we process, you know, process that through both our education and our interpretive programs. Um, we also believe in great design. Um, and we think that beauty is one of the things that are important in parks. And so we have a lot of natural beauty, but we also have design spaces. And I think this picture really captures um, the, just the sort of creativity and the effort that, that our planners and designers put into it. And that's the bike path on the right and the park road on the left. And then there's kind of a, a grand alley, which is a festival plaza and so on uh, down the middle. This is another before and after. So this was an old dairy farm. We bought it. It was the seventh generation of the family to live on that farm. And they literally farmed it up until the day we bought it, which was about three years before this picture was taken. So it got a little ragged. So our designers wanted to sort of pay homage to that, uh, you know, the 200 years in which we were an agricultural economy and really you know, sort of reinterpret that. And so here it is under construction. And you can see the silo is being converted into an overlook. We put a spiral staircase into it. Um, the pigsty is now the picnic pavilion. Um, we, we took at the old barn. We actually ultimately had to tear down the barn. The engineers would not let us bring the public into it. But we hired an Amish company. And they built this really beautiful event barn. This was on our grand opening on October the 16th. Um, so you can sort of see that, that transformation of that space. Um, this is just another shot from there. This is the spiral staircase inside the, the silo, and then that's the silo itself. Um, this is the inside of the event barn at a member event that we had recently. Um, OK, so all of that work that went into acquiring the land, doing a master plan, building it, you know, again, our goal was get them open. And so we opened Turkey Run Park, a third of the four parks total in this on October the 16th. And this is just a screenshot from our web page. What I want to do now is just show you the reward, OK, of all the things that you all work on every day. And this is, I'm, hopefully I'll shut up. Sometimes I have a hard time shutting up. But, um, but I'll just show you these pictures. Can't shut up on this one. These are th the three greatest living Kentucky bluegrass musicians, uh, Ricky Skaggs, Rhonda Vincent, and Sam Bush. If any bluegrass fans are in the audience, we had a big concert with them last year. That's like 37 Grammy Awards um, on the stage. This is our bike path, just a one section. Our paddling trail. And you can see one of our park bridges in the background. We have about a 25 mile long paddling trail. Um, we are. Very diligent. We don't get a lot of snow in Kentucky, but our roads and bike path are cleared faster than any place else in the city. This is the U of L women's track and cross country team. They had nowhere to train, and the ACC championships were coming up. And they put this on fa our Facebook page as a thank you to our maintenance guys um, about you know just. Um, but again, you know, sort of health and getting outdoors. And this is the uh, end of one of our summer camps. This is our spray ground. This is from our grand opening. Some of you know Chris Chandler. He's actually the, in the middle there in the blue shirt. He's a TNC guy in Kentucky. We have about 200 acres of agriculture in the park, and it is integrated into the design, the idea being that an urban kid on a bike could see a farmer on a tractor. Um, we also have community gardens and, and so on. Um, and then we also earn income. We make about 25 grand a year. It's not a lot, but it goes into our education pot. Um, Think long term about sustainability. These people got married in our park, right? Assuming they stay married, then um, there's, <laughs> then uh, you know, hopefully they're going to have a sort of lifelong bond with what what happens here. Um, this is our bike path. Just another shot. That's my wife on the left. She's in the audience here. Um, this is part of that sort of walking system. It's another one of our bike bridges. Um, I was out there recently, and I found three plants I hadn't seen in the park, all of which I learned from Tom Sycama in local flora when I was at the forestry school. So um, we hold all kinds of events in the park. This was a, a fundraiser that we threw in a walnut grove, so it was sort of a white table cloth dinner, but um, in the middle of the park. Um, this is another one of our education programs. Again, access is critical at all ability levels. This is an ADA accessible fishing platform we built. We have a great partnership with Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, in which they stock all of our ponds. Um, and then through the season, somebody mentioned kind of 12 season use. So just I had a few slides about um, 
This, by the way, is a completely restored meadow. So that was filled with invasive species when we came in and, and cleared them out. Um, Funding-wise, all of those were EQIP grants. And again, just another pot of money. They loved coming into the city and working because most of their work in Kentucky is out in rural areas. And we've raised about $300,000 to date, which goes a long way in conservation work. This is in the summer. Fall, winter. We don't get a lot of snow in Kentucky, but um, we're developing a little fly fishing culture. Kentucky is a bass fishing state, so that's kind of a big deal. All right, so <clears throat> get, got it. Five minutes. So I'm gonna. All right, now I'm gonna teach you everything I've learned in five minutes. So. Um, very quickly, any project you do, I don't care if it's a park project, uh, starting a new business, there are four basic questions you should ask yourself uh, and your, your constituents as you build it. Why are we doing this? Who are we doing it for? What are we providing them? And how do we do that? All right? So the why for us is parks or city shaping infrastructure, put it in first. Okay? You might have different whys. That's fine. But that is the one that, and in Louisville to say that we're doing again what we did 100 years from, with Olmstead was an easy sell. Parks have a very uh, intimate connection with people in, a, uh, you know, in their lives. I was in a public meeting where I mentioned the Olmstead Parks and a guy raised his hand and said my parents always told me I was conceived in an Olmstead Park. So <laughs> that's pretty intimate. Um, the who, who are your audiences? And a lot of park planners turn this over to the architects. I love architects, you've gotta have great architects if you want great design, but they're not the ones who should be deciding who the audiences that you serve are. And it is absolutely critical early in a project that you are disciplined in how you do this. Um, I already mentioned ours is the 90%, okay? Some parks are destination parks. The Statue of Liberty is a destination park. But Central Park is our great model because of the great diversity of ages and abilities and people that it serves, and that's the 90%. It's nothing wrong with 10% uses like ball fields and so on, but I think great urban parks always serve the 90%. Um, so what do you build them? Uh, so you know, again, you have to match the amenities. If you work for Procter & Gamble and you're designing a bar of soap for old people in China or young people in America, you know those are different audiences for which you are creating a different product. Same can be applied to parks. Our basic idea is it should be systemic, it must be public and it should be world class. It is worth raising the money and investing it in great design and great execution. It will pay off in park use and most importantly, sustainability. It'll still be there in 100 years if you build it right. And again, that's you know, kind of our idea. So how do you do it? Okay, <laughs> this is key, governance. Just like, I, as I said before, public to private, figure out where your project should be and be there, doesn't matter. I'm, not, I'm at completely agnostic about this. There are great public park systems. We're almost completely private and we're running a public park. So anywhere on that spectrum works with good leadership. Um, partnerships, we already talked about. Master planning is obvious. One little addition, our master plan runs with the land. That means when I'm dead and gone, my evil successor, uh, there are ways to tweak it but they can't come in and tear it up. If you make the investment in that quality, you plan a forest that you want to be there in 100 years, you want that to be protected uh, with the full force of the law. Um, we've talked a lot about people and nature. Um, a lot of people tend to line up on one side of this. Big mistake in my opinion. P public parks, particularly in cities, are about people and nature. Even wilderness areas in Montana are ultimately city parks because 98% of their users are urbanites. Okay, but it is, again, very important that you self-identify where on that spectrum from people, you know, sort of Millennium Park in Chicago to um, uh, a wilderness area in Montana. We're about 75 to 80% natural area in our project, and we've been very intentional about that from the beginning. You gotta have great circulation that connects a bunch of special places. Don't forget about operations, okay? If it's not safe, people won't use it. If it's not clean, they won't come back. They're going there for fun and beautiful is great architecture. It is worth it. I can tell you over and over again, people come to us, and these are not wealthy people, and comment on how beautiful this park is and how meaningful it is to them to be in a space that is, was built and operated at that quality because most of them don't have access to that level of quality in their lives. Um, gotta have a sustainable business model. And this is bottom line, our consulting business, when we go out and talk to people, if they don't think they can, can sustain it, 
we tell them don't build it. The best money you ever spent was hiring us to tell you that. So our business model is based on three things. We have an endowment, which hopefully will generate about 60%. Uh, and then the other sort of 30 to 40 percent, about half will be earned income from our, you know, weddings in the Geens Lodge that I showed you, our consulting business, and so on. And the other half, we're a nonprofit, so we hold annual fundraisers, we have memberships, and we have an annual fund draft. And that's our business model. And, you know, we created it about five years ago, and so far, so good. Um, we are a donor-supported public park. All right, so again, remember, always ask yourself why, who, what, how. <clears throat> Two sort of object lessons, and then I promise, Colleen, I'll be, be done. This was a report that was prepared for sort of looking at the urbanization of China. It was published in 2009, I think. And its prediction was that between 2009 and 2025, China's urban population would grow by 350 million people. So that means that in 16 years, they have to build an urban infrastructure for a population greater than the United States. And this was the, you know, the, the gurus at McKinsey's guide to that. Guess how many times they mentioned parks? Zero. Okay? So to get back to that point about parks are infrastructure. People see them as soft infrastructure. They're not soft infrastructure, and here's why. This is the next object lesson. Many of you may have heard of the Beltline. Alexander Garvin, a, a Yale professor, designed it. This is a five-year-old slide, and I used to say, you know, the Beltline is great. It's about a third the size of our project. It's four times the cost, but it's very politically complex because they're trying to go back in and retrofit. Okay, uh, Wall Street Journal about a year ago wrote an update. It's now a $40 billion project. They started before us, they built four miles of bike path. Okay, I'm not, this is in no way a criticism of the Beltline. It's an incredible project. It reflects the difficulties of trying to go back in and retrofit parks infrastructure. And that brings me back to my, the beginning of my talk and the last point. Time is of the essence, okay? If the rest of the world is pouring into cities, and this is not by the millions, this is by the billions, between now and 2050, if they set aside land ahead of the growth of the city, and if they build systemic public world-class park systems, they're gonna have world-class cities. If they don't, they're gonna be Atlanta, and they're gonna be trying to come back and retrofit, which is very, very hard to do. All right, I don't know if I have time for questions, or, okay, thank you very much. Questions? Comments? Yes, sir. So in your, in your quest to be like, I feel as an environmental leader, in your, your quest to set aside parkland for the, for the expansion of cities, um, how do you go about amassing all the political, social, community, um, economic forces that help you bring this plan together? Well, we met with a lot of people. So we held big public meetings, um, you know, early in the process where we got a lot of public uh, input. We held neighborhood meetings through, you know, individually. Um, we met with a lot of individuals, particularly if anyone ever had an issue with us. Um, you know, like in a public meeting, people have commented. Anybody's run public meetings know people get angry. We always said, look, we'll come meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, and we always did. Um, and generally speaking, we were able to work out their problem. Uh, we obviously worked, so that's kind of at the grassroots, you know, neighborhood level. We worked a lot at the, you know, kind of the high level with the mayor of the city and city council and all of our state representatives and our federal representatives to let them know. Um, and, you know, just full disclosure, I'm a private sector guy. We controlled the money. And so um, all of the fundraising flowed through us, and that was very important in enabling us to constantly show momentum and progress. And that is one of the most important things. Once a big project has been announced, if people see momentum, your, your support is gonna build. If they don't, and I don't know if she's still here, but the woman from Detroit, I have a very similar comment. I always say in our Metro Parks Department, there's a sagging shell filled with uh, master plans that never got built. Um, and, and so people have a certain cynicism about these kind of big splash projects. So if you can build momentum, um, and almost every time I met with a major donor to ask for a gift, I had a new piece of news because we were buying all these uh, real these properties, we were raising other money, and that momentum is incredibly powerful in building support, even if you're a you know kind of fairly quiet private sector organization. Yes. Uh, so you, you've spoken a lot about 
You've spoken a lot about the, uh, the necessity of having connectivity between your parks. How do you see your parks being connected to other efforts going on in the region, in particular in the Ohio River Valley, and how do, you, how do you see bridging connection between all the different efforts going on? Yeah, so a couple of things. On the bike side, our 19 miles is part of the city's plan to build a 100-mile bike loop around the city. So they built 25 miles in the west end. We're building 19 miles um, in the east end, and then they have to connect at the north and the south. All the master planning for that has been done. They have a lot of money to raise. They have land uh, issues. But we all of our planning sort of rode on the backs of, you know, the other master planning that had been done. We, we went in other directions in certain areas um, from a sort of, you know, car and bus, you know, transportation. Each one of our four parks has a major gateway, which is tied into the regional transportation system. So it's very easy. And Louisville, like Birmingham, is very much a car culture. I mean, that's, you know, it's, um, uh, but we also are working very hard, not just to connect around the outside of the city, but to build spokes into the city so that we can bring, you know, people can come out. And then we've also spent a lot of time working with TARC, which is our public system about things like a park bus, right, that on weekends and holidays in the summer would, would be on a schedule and you'd be very easy to sort of, now, a lot of these things are aspirational at this point, but all of the planning is in place to sort of execute and build those partnerships as the thing goes forward. Could I, could I ask, too, just briefly, what about connections between other metro areas in the Ohio River Valley? I'm, I'm a Cincinnati guy, um, and, and, you know, talking about the regional health of the Ohio River Valley is about getting everybody on the same page, whether it's from Pittsburgh to Cincinnati on down to Paducah. So do you make any, any kind of effort to uh, make partnerships there? We do. I mean, well, so we were a consultant on the Ohio River Greenway, which is the, the greenway across the river in Indiana. Um, and, you know, part of that was how do we connect what's happening on the Kentucky side? And some of that's already happened. There is one bridge, bike bridge, that connects. Um, there's some discussions uh, with Lexington about connectivity. Regionally, not so great. Okay, I mean, there's, there's, it's mostly discussion and, uh, um, a, you know, now kind of smaller regional, Louisville, southern Indiana, the, you know, sort of 20-county region, I think there's a lot of potential to do that. And there are some kind of interesting plans in the works. I mean, the Atlanta Belt Line, I think, is a really interesting case study where uh, there wasn't a lot of wiggle room, but um, there was a, there has been a lot done with a very small amount of space, and it kind of, um, you know, and it's having a reactionary uh, kind of uh, effect on the surrounding urbanism, which I think is like a, a strategic move to have a park influence its surroundings. Right. And so I just want to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, how, I, I like the way that you're thinking about this, the momentum building and the negotiation process to get you know, to, to, to make these steps. Is, is there a, an issue with the Atlanta Beltline, or do you think that it's just a different situation given the retrofit and the challenges it faces? Well, yeah, don't get me wrong. I love the Atlanta Beltline. I think it's an incredible project. My point is just if you don't put it in first and you have to retrofit, it's politically difficult, it's very expensive, and it moves very slowly. But I love the project. I think it's a brilliant project. And if you think about the High Line and what it did, you know, it can, so, you know, I'm working on the urban edge, but you can also come back and use parks to sort of, and that was one of the reasons I was on the committee on the panels, that we talked about both expanding and shrinking cities, because the urban edge is not just sort of, you know, that, that the, you know, the, the, the edge of uh, growing places. Like in Detroit, it's, it's that, you know, kind of the, the suburbs, it's sort of that hollowed out area. So there are a lot of different ways. I just happen to work on the urban edge. Now, I do think if you go globally, where you have these cities, like if you've seen pictures, or, or I've never been to Mexico City, but I've seen a lot of pictures, you know, where it's just this immense sprawl, and there's very little green space. Imagine if you had this kind of Olmstedian system, and obviously in these cities of 30 million people, these have to be big parks, which means a couple of things. It means you can serve a lot of people. It also means you can really begin to do the kinds of kind of natural areas planning, biodiversity planning, because you have a much more systemic uh, set of tools to work with. So, so by no means am I being critical of, of the Beltline. I'm just saying it's, it's in, in, our, our job was hard, but in some ways it was easier than that, if that makes sense. Okay. 
So what is the combination of funding? You spoke about earmark earlier, correct? Yeah, so and so it was a total of how much? Yeah, so capital funding, $125 million, okay. of which 38 was federal, 10 was state, a million and a half was city, and all the rest, about 75 million was privately raised, and then the 32 million in endowment was all privately raised. Wow. So we've raised over $100 million in private funds and about $50 million in public funds. So I'm trying to make a connection to, I mean, this is like steroids, right, what you did. It is. I don't yeah. know any project, I don't know any project that's moved that quickly from its inception to completion to all that fundraising, et cetera. So uh, is it the business acumen? I mean, what, what came to be that brought all that together so quickly? Well, I mean, there, you know, it was, so I finished the forestry school in 06, went back and took it on as a full-time job. I had founded it before then, but it wasn't, you know, it was sort of minding its time, if you will. Um, you know, I, I do have some sort of hardcore entrepreneurs on my board, um, and, and the basic expectation of me and of our project is it was going to get done uh, in a reasonable period of time. It was going to be world-class quality and it was going to be sustainable. So we had a, um, now those entrepreneurs also, you know, put resources into the project. Um, Kentucky, you know, on the $38 million, you know, we're a small state with a very powerful senator, Mitch McConnell. And so whatever you think of Mitch McConnell, he was a great supporter of this project. Um, and again, it was an earmark. Earmarks are gone, but you all know, you've worked in the public sector. There are always ways to fund particularly if you have a good project. The other thing is we didn't really go to the public sector until we had already raised about 12 to $15 million. We were demonstrating that we were also raising operating funds and that we wouldn't be coming back to them. So we had a lot of sort of good, you know, good things. We had very bipartisan support, um, you know, at the, both the Metro Council level in city government at our state level um, delegation from Jefferson County and surrounding counties, both of those um, groups wrote unanimous letters in support of our project. So, um, um, so there was a lot of different, and then there was a lot of serendipity. And I've told you all the good stories. There's plenty of bad stories in this project. You know, we in our consulting business, we say we sell our scars because we we did we made some mistakes, um, as you always do. And that, and if you, I mean, if you ever think you're going to do it for the younger people in the audience, you're always going to make mistakes. Don't worry about it. Just pick yourself up and. Go back to work, and as long as people see you working at it and fixing it and moving on, nobody's going to hold you. And, you know, they're going to be proud of you for doing that. So. Can you say a quick word about the operating model and whether operations are funded as part of the endowment? Um, you know, what's the scale of operations? Yeah, so, so we estimate fully open, which will be next year, although we may not quite be fully um, operational at that time, about $4 million annually. So again, about 60% 60, um, 60 of that, roughly somewhere um, around there, would come from the endowment. So um, that means we ultimately need a kind of 50 to $60 million endowment. And then the remaining roughly 30 to 40%, about half would be earned income. So we have um, this year um, at that building where you saw the wedding, we'll net about $200,000. We made about $250,000 in our consulting business last year. We have an organizational leadership product that we do that um, actually uh, builds a lot on what I learned at the forestry school. We, have a, we teach people to read the landscape as a kind of analogy for systems, and we take sort of stressed out corporate people and we throw them in the woods for a day, and they love it. So, um, so it, uh, And then the last piece is we are a nonprofit, so we have two annual fundraising events, one out in the park, um, one where we bring in Kirk Herbstreet. If there's any college football fans, he's the ESPN Guy, people come to that because it's Kirk Herb Street, and it's a great way for us to raise money for people who might not be passionate about parks. And then we have 2,000 members, which ultimately we want to grow to about 10,000 uh, members. And we and we also have an annual, you know, we actually have a, a sort of chairs and steering committee that we go out and actively make requests for annual, you know, kind of bigger annual gifts. Um, currently, we have about, I think, 39 employees, and that'll probably um, go up. And that was like three years ago, we had about eight employees. And, you know, when I came back from, yeah, we had three employees. So um, it will probably, my guess is, is that we'll end up somewhere around sort of 50, you know, year-round employees and then some seasonal staff beyond that. We don't, we don't know exactly. 
I, I wonder, given that you were building an urban park, whether you had any sort of additional challenges in buying land up or co co convincing people that they wanted land that was, if you like, already natural. So like buying up farmland, buying up forest land. That, that, so it, there, was no, there was no restoration aspect necessarily per se. If that presents any additional, sort of any sort of fresh challenges when people try and do these similar kind of projects. You mean, are you saying, is it more challenging to buy farmland as opposed to buying land that is always sort of in a good natural state? Well, I'm just kind of coming across as, as, you know, as a European. So I was in the Netherlands for a few months recently, and, and you can't retrofit, right? It's already there. You get on a bike path, you go out, you're in the forest and you're on the farm and you already see people on tractors because that's where your kids bike path. I mean, that's where they, that's where everything goes. It's, it's already in the landscape. Right. Well, and, and there are still a lot of working farms in and around, you know, around our project, but it all eight of the ten fastest growing census tracts in 2010 were in or right next to. So this is a very fast growing part of Louisville. Um, so um, you know, we we were interested in in connectivity and acreage. All of our land is or will be protected in perpetuity for public use and access. And our master plan runs with the land. So my evil successor can't sell it. The mayor's evil successor can't sell it. And by the way, on the, the city brought in some land. Th those deed restrictions uh, run in favor of the public. So for the lawyers in the room, that means 100 years from now, any citizen could file a cause of action uh, to block the sale of that property. That allows us to begin to take all that land. And I think this is a really good lesson because I think a lot of times we we uh, put a lot of resources into saving the kind of last great place. And I'm, again, just like the, I'm not, I'm not, that's not a criticism, but in a place like Kentucky, there really aren't many last great places. You know, the whole state pretty much was cleared and farmed. Now, th those farms began to be abandoned, you know, 70, 80 years. So we have some second growth forest. Um, but, uh, but our goal is to say, what does it look like in 100 years? And because it's protected, we can make the investments now in forest. So you can, in my opinion, you can take any property if you have, and that's really applying a kind of TNC model to that. The other thing that's really interesting is when we started looking, we found that we had a lot of good stuff. We found the oldest forest in Jefferson County, a beach forest of about 30 acres over 200 years old. We found to date probably somewhere between 50 and 100 trees, we haven't cored them all, that are probably at least 250 to 300 years old. Kentucky, the bluegrass region of which we're on the edge, you know, Lexington and horse country is the famous part, is famous for what they locally call the venerable trees. We have one of the largest collections of isolated old growth trees in the country and probably the world. And it turns out we hired this great naturalist named Michael Gage who just finished a very similar project on Great Mountain Forest. I introduced him to Dean Crane. I hired him and I told him, I said, go find the 100 special places on this property. And, you know, and he turned up all kinds of stuff. You know, who would have known that we had trees that were, you know, uh, 300 years old? And we did core a few of them to confirm that. So, um, so it's really about the long-term view. And I think that's very important on the kind of wilding side and the natural areas side is to be patient, take the long view, um, make the investments now. Make sure your investments are protected so the next generation whose priorities might be different, um, you know, uh, won't, won't come in and tear apart what you did. I think we're going to have to cut off the questions there. I'm happy to talk to anyone afterwards if you have a question. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, if, you're, if you're anything like me after that presentation, you're thinking, wow. Um, <laughs> And I want to thank Dan at, for, for three different things. One is for an incredible, uh, incredible presentation, which is not only inspirational, I think, uh, but also I think brings together all the, th all the themes from, from the workshop, the idea of uh, parks within expanding and contracting areas, you know, how wild can it be, this interesting mix of, of, of uses in this park, and also you know, how do you pay for these things and how do you sustain them over the long run. Um, all of that in addition to making our school look good by being a graduate of it. So uh, let's all thank Dan for okay, that. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I should also thank him because uh, uh, 21st Century Parks, uh, along with the New York City Urban Field Station and the Hickson Center for Urban Ecology, are, are the three sponsors of this, uh, this uh, conference today. Um, and I also wanted to uh, thank um, some of the people, uh, well, I want to thank the, the, the uh, three moderators and the nine panelists, of course. We've seen them throughout the day. But there's some people who worked behind the scenes that I'd like to uh, mention as well.
Um, I guess the other thing I should say about Dan is that, in, in some sense, this, the, the, the theme of this conference uh, came about because of a conversation that occurred between Dan and, and Dean Crane some months ago. Um, and, you know, the Hickson Center has had conferences like this before, and we, we all saw it as a fantastic uh, opportunity. So uh, we thank him for that as well. But uh, I also want to just mention that we have the, um, there was a planning committee that, that took the basic idea and came up with the, uh, the, the, the panels and fleshed it out. Uh, and besides Colleen and myself, that includes Mark Ashton, Mark Bradford, uh, Morgan Grove, um, Brad Gentry, uh, Bram Gunther, Dan, uh, Dan um, and Oz Schmitz, and Erica Svensson, uh, almost all of whom are, are, are here today. And in addition, things like this can't happen without the incredible um, organizational and operational uh, skills of, of a bunch of people, but in particular, um, Anna Pickett with the um, uh, with URI on the staff there, uh, ably assisted by uh, a student, Carol Lee. And then, uh, absolutely, of course, um, we have to thank um, Colleen Murphy Dunning. Uh, I was with her the other day, and she paid a compliment to one of our colleagues, saying that that person was both um, very smart and very nice. And I would love to turn that around uh, to, to Colleen, who is as we all know, is very smart, uh, incredibly capable, and very, very, very nice. Okay, so um, that largely brings us to a conclusion. I, I know that a lot of the panelists, moderators, Dan, uh, the dean, are all still here, and we have uh, coffee and cookies, and we can have a uh, continued conversation out out of this room. So thanks thank you all for coming.